We're back. We are back with Out of Your League. I'm looking to my left. I'm seeing Mark Flanagan with a blue microphone, a white T-shirt. And, and so they're not skinny jeans, but slim fit. Mm, I got slim, yeah. Slim fit and some climbing shoes, climbing boots. Um, just winter boots. A lot of puddles out, isn't there? So I didn't want to put my trainers on. With a sort of red and, mm. and white and black lace. Customised like it with a bit. It is like a, a climbing uh, yeah. bit of attire. I thought they it? could do with a pop of colour, so I went with the red oh, lace. Yes. How are you? Uh, yeah, I'm very well, thanks. Yeah, yeah good. really good. Very good. You yeah. look well. Thanks. You yeah. you look well. Yeah. And to my right, I see Kyle Amor, mm. teammate of yours, Mark. At St. Yeah. Helens. Are yeah. you friends? Are you friends off off the mic? Co- former colleagues. I think oh. you'd say. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> no. Shots no, fired. Um, Early no, shots on, fired. Honestly, yeah, me and, me and Kyle, um, yeah. Old colleagues. Oof. Colleagues. Old old. Old. Well, well, I'll, 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 I'll roll with colleagues. I'll roll with colleagues. I'll roll with If I'd asked you that first, you'd have said, yeah, no, we could make it. Yeah, I'd have said, yeah. Because yeah, he's full of shit. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Not many a good night with Kyle. We go back a long way. Got many good stories and um, mutual friends. And... Well, do you want to tell some? No, 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 it's not about us. It's not about us. Do you want to describe what Kyle's wearing as well for those who aren't watching? So I'd say slim fit, short sleeve. Shirt. Top button donut. You do like a top button. I do button. like a top button donut. Is there do much like room in there? It looks a bit so snug. Like a, you're like a mod, aren't you? You're a bit of a mod. Off two fingers in there. Sorry. Two fingers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what she like said. a prostate exam. Yeah, we were talking about prostates, weren't we? Yeah, we were. I wasn't, mm. wasn't going to go there, Mark, but you've just mentioned it now. We were talking about get, get your prostates checked. Get your prostates checked. The reason yeah. we did check that, uh, we didn't check, we didn't check Kyle's. <laughs> but we, were, we, went for, we went for a group we, we didn't we? Checked each other. We went for a group we, and yeah. uh, Mark, yours sounded sort of powerful and consistent, and, and there was a bit of a drip on, on Kyle. Mm. So we sort of said, you know, and he's 36. Should he, you asked me, should he get a check? I said, I had, I had the, uh, the, the full rummage around a couple of months ago, so why not? You've given me the food for thought for <laughs> now, all these next couple. Days. I'll give you food and oh, thoughts. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Uh, and f- look, Mark, if I just stretch it a little bit further to your yep. left, I see a fine looking man with a mm. fine head of hair. Yeah, we're all very jealous of his Grey mile. Yeah, he keeps saying, I think, I think you're balder than I am, but look, we'll address yeah. that at the time. Yeah. Um, we'll you, get John's opinion. Yeah, <laughs> probably. Well, I, I didn't consider going to Turkey and you did. Look, it's not about us, Mark. Oh, sorry. So, don't remember, we've got a guest okay. here with us. Yeah. This, this about, <laughs> um, for those who, who haven't seen him yet, Mark, he's I'd say he's like a sort of I don't know, like a, a Tongan Kendall. He's perfectly groomed, isn't he? Sort of Tongan slash Samoan. Lovely Kendall. side parting, mm-hmm. grey mile uh, jumper on in there. Very happy he cuts smiley and face. And always very, 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 happy. Always very happy. happy. Can you tell who it is yet? Um, <laughs> it's John Asiata. <laughs> it's John Asiata. <laughs> yeah. Or we should do his song. I was, just sold my, my car, car to John Asiata. <laughs> Just sold my car to John Asiata. <laughs> but that, that's Nightcrawlers, by the way, that song, isn't it? Yeah. So, because yeah. I, I thought it was uh, Mufasa, who's the guy, you know, he's, it's Friday, yeah, then Saturday, Sunday, what? Yeah. But it's not, it's, it's Nightcrawlers. Not. Oh. And actually, I mean, the Lee fans singing that, John, are just yeah. basically sort of giving money to webuyanycar.com, aren't they? Mm. Oh. And Hopefully. if they'd like to sponsor Hopefully. the podcast, yeah. we buy any part, car dot com. Park. you like to do it? <laughs> yeah. If you want to just sponsor do it down the podcast, camera, which yeah. camera do you want to do it down? That'd be great. We're open to offers. Um, yeah, and we'll get, buy some cheap cars. Yeah, and we'll just sing. Any help? Yeah, every <laughs> penny help. Is Are that we? your full name, John? I see. No, it. no, no. It's not. Um, can, I, can I? Is it? Is this? Can I pronounce it right? Atalani Salaselli Asiata. Yep, yep. So it's Atalani John Salaselli Asiata. Oh, John is in there. No, yeah, John's so not John, just like John is in there. Um, but since school, primary school, teachers sort of struggled to say my name, so they took out Atalani, they took out Silicelli and just called me John. <laughs> so they did that. They chose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They just sort of shortened my name, and then um, as I started playing league, it was just John Asiad. I never, never had Atalani and Silicelli. How do your parents feel about <laughs> teachers choosing what to call you? <laughs> Man, my parents, my parents are pretty easy going. They just call me John now, so right. they, they don't really. The only time we use my name is um, if there is a Samoan tradition thing that's happening, yeah. or I have to use my passport or anything like that with my proper ID. That's the only time I use my full name. Mm-hmm. Well, as a guy commentating on games, I'm so glad that you do roll with John. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. I think a lot of people. So, are. Yeah, that would be yeah. And, and you two have got a little something in common as well because actually John was born in Penrith. Right. Yeah. Right. But not, that, not that one, not the not, Cumbria. Not, not your not one. Oh, I was thinking, not, right. Okay. Oh, not thinking, the Cumbria. There's wow. a place called Penrith, Mark, in Cumbria. Got excited. Yeah, I know. Yeah. 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 So on the subject of Tonga <clears throat> and Samoa, so am I right in saying, so your, your dad is fully Samoan? Yeah. 
right? And your mum is half Tongan and half Samoan. Yep. <laughs> I mean, and obviously you were born in in Australia. Uh, Australia, yep, yep. So, childhood, tell us all about that. How 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 sort of much was it influenced by a Samoan and a Tongan heritage? Yeah, I think um, obviously growing up, um, I was surrounded more with my Samoan side. Mm. Um, Samoan, my family, obviously my dad being full Samoan, uh, we had majority of his siblings living around us. Um, most of my mum's family sort of lived in New Zealand. Um, and, I, and at that time, I think I only went to New Zealand probably two or three times. Mm. So my mum's side, I sort of didn't really have much to do with. Um, and then obviously when I had the opportunity to pick who I wanted to play for, um, one of the main reasons why I wanted to go play for Tonga at some stage of my career was to sort of bridge that gap um, to try and get our families back together. Um, so for me it was to understand where I was from, um, my Tongan heritage, um, you know, obviously what they do traditionally because it's a little bit different. Um, but then obviously one day go to Tonga and then meet everyone over there. So um, throughout that whole process, like it was, it was crazy um, because a lot of people questioned if I was really Tongan. Um, but obviously there's a, a lot of people outside of the family and friends that didn't know really who I am. Mm -hmm. um, so growing up in both traditions and learning about, you know, Tongan uh, culture, Samoan culture, there wasn't far, it wasn't, too much different but there was little things in there that I didn't really understand of one culture than compared to the other um, but it, it was one of the experiences that I've I've you know in my career I'm glad I did because it bridged the gap between my family and brought a lot of people back together amazing yeah. that's the thing isn't it it's, it's about culture it's about it, blood it's about yeah. history and heritage it's more, more than just what shirt you put on isn't it yeah. 100% can you give us an example of what you mean by the difference between one of the cultures to the other just out of my own interest to you yeah, I think it's um, the way they celebrate um, certain um, occasions. Um, uh, what we do in the Samoan culture um, in regards to sort of say weddings and stuff, we have a lot of, um, let's say, um, like high chiefs that come together and then we also give gifts to different families and stuff like that. Um, and people bring their own sort of gifts to give to you. Um, but majority of the time we... Um, let's say, um, where we're not really receiving anything, we, we it's all about giving. Um, whereas in the Tongan culture, um, just the way they do it, um, they have like obviously a massive um, pig in the middle, um, a lot of dancing celebrations. Um, and then uh, they do, still don't quite understand um, what they sort of do, but it's it, the way they present their gifts and stuff to families and stuff like that. It's very different. Um, is that religious? Or is that, is no, I think it's just a culture thing. Um, and for me, because I didn't speak the language, it also um, it also made it a lot more difficult. So majority of the time that I was there, I had to ask Jason or can you like explain to me what's what's Is really happening Jason Tomlolo? yeah Jason Tomlolo or whoever was there next to me they sort of had to sort of briefly explain to me um why they're doing this and why they're doing that um so it, it was still sort of new to me even though I was in camp and sort of try to understand the culture of Tonga um but it's yeah it's still pretty hard for me to sort of explain as a kid, then did you did you go to the islands? Did you what are your sort of memories of going there and exploring that side of things? Because you yeah. obviously were born in Australia, but yep. it's not too far, is it, from where you were? Yeah, but I, I I've only been to Samoa once, right. um, and I've only been to Tonga once. Okay. Um, Samoa, I was only eight when I went, so I don't remember too much, and I know that a lot has changed since then. Mm. Um, and then Tonga, obviously, I went um, after the the games against Australia and Great Britain uh, a couple of years back. So. So, you, so you didn't feel like an Australian as a kid? I felt more like an Australian as a kid um, because that's where I grew up. That's where I sort of, you know, I was raised in Australia. Um, and it was hard for me to sort of find uh, sort of my culture besides learning off my, my parents, uh, my grandma, um, siblings, um, it was hard to really understand fully the culture because I wasn't sort of in it, if you understand. Mm -hmm. um, like I've only been to Samoa once uh, when I was eight. 
um, and then obviously Tonga really late uh, it's just a couple of years ago so understanding my culture I only have sort of what I've learnt mm -hmm. of my of my parents um, that's sort of my knowledge of our culture um, but then obviously um, I'm being ingrained with you know growing up in the Australian culture as well mm. so just with playing for both of them Samoa and Tonga in quite a short space of time yeah. what would John Asiata class himself as Samoan or Tongan? I'll, I'll class myself as both, um, always, uh, uh, because also. that's 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 who I am um, <laughs> deep down inside. Um, um, I'm part Tongan, I'm part Samoan, um, even though... Does that uh, sit well with other players then, if you're, rather than being in one camp as opposed to... You know what I'm saying, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. Um, I don't know. It's a hard question for me to answer because, you know, obviously when I was in Samoan camp, it was awesome. Mm -hmm. Went into Tongan camp, they took me in. Right. Um, but then the last World Cup, I was in Samoan camp helping the Samoan team out. So um, it, it's a question that I sort of can't answer. <laughs> um, and it's a question that I hope that, you know, as Doc Usos, we all accept one another, um, no matter who you are, where, you, where you're from. Um, but to be able to just, you know, help in some way. Um, and that's what I wanted to do for Samoan camp. I knew that my decision of choosing to go back and play for Samoa there was a great chance that I wasn't going to get picked which I didn't um, but I still wanted to help them throughout their campaign which they allowed me to come back there's a, there's a great bond between a lot of the Polynesian boys I mean on the field the rivalry is as fierce and as any match you'll see but I think from the lads I've hung around with who are Samoan or Tongan or even for the Cook Islands, there's a, there's a real bond between the guys I think because you have differences in your culture but there's massive similarities as well isn't there yeah, exactly right. I think the similarities that we have um, as both cultures is the amount of heart and love that we have for people. Um, it's all about sharing experiences, sharing your, you know, your culture. Um, it's all about, you know, giving, and, and that's what we do. We always look after each other, no matter where you're from. Um, and I think that's one of the things that I've learned from my parents is, um, no matter what bad someone has done to you, um, don't use that to sort of want to get revenge because that's not what we're about. Uh, no matter how they're bad they are to you, because I'm also Christian, um, the way I walk my life is is I want to treat people um, the way that I want to be treated. And if they do bad to you, then that's their decision. But I've got to treat them the way that I want to be treated anyway. So, um, but most guys that I know um, in the Pacific culture, um, it's all about, you know, what can you do to help a brother out? And, and it's always been like that. Mm. So your wife as well is part Tonga because her mum yep. is from Tonga, which throws another dynamic yep, yep. into the mix, doesn't it? I thought it was a good place to start with the pod, really, because, you know, obviously you missed out on the World Cup, which must have been really disappointing. And as you just sort of briefly said there, for those trying to work out, hold on, when did he play for to Samoa? When did he play for Tonga? It was Samoa first, yep. then it was Tonga, right? And then you wanted to go back and play this World Cup in, in England that we just had yep. in a Samoan shirt, but that didn't work out. What was that like for you when, when you didn't get the call? Um, I was pretty gutted, um, but I knew the decision that I made to go back, um, that there was a good chance that I wasn't going to get picked. Um, obviously, being over here in Super League, um, and then you got, you know, majority of the guys playing in the NRL. Uh, obviously, the coaches around there. You were playing championship there. last season as well. Yeah, so, yeah. That, that's so that was another, uh, another factor that I sort of took in. Um, but I know what I can do. Uh, I knew my style of play. I knew how 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 of a player that I, I am, that I can, you know, what I can give to a team. Um, and if I got picked, I was happy. But if I didn't, obviously I was disappointed. But in some way, I knew I was going to try and help them mm. with their campaign. So how did the coach and staff at Tonga, uh, when you told them that you were thinking about going back to Samoa, how did that go down? He's a traitor. No, nah, really good. Um, Wolfie was really good with me. I, I called him and I sort of explained my reason. Um, and he said, whatever's in your heart, brother, you, you go you go with that. And um, he wanted someone to, you know, obviously play for Tonga. If his heart's there, then that's where he, that's where he wants you. And um, for me, my heart was with Samoa to go hopefully play World Cup because who knows, that could have been probably be my last opportunity to well, do a World your Cup. Last, the way you play, there's another World well, Cup in, in Asia. Yeah, there's another one in 30. Uh, 30, 30. Now. Mm. So you've still got chance yep. of another World Cup. Oh, well, so, this means it's going to be Tonga this time, though, doesn't it? No, nah, no, nah, it will still be some <laughs> more. Still no, but be come some on, more. You, you've got a World Cup in you in three and a half years. Yeah, yeah. I, I look after my body pretty well. Uh, I do my best to make sure I'm ready to go every week. And um, as long as I can keep doing that, um, I put myself in a pretty good, you know, yeah. 
I will put them, put myself in a chance to to make it. So we're not ruling another World Cup out, John. I like it. I won't I'll rule it out. It. It's actually a really interesting debate, Carl, Mark, and John, because I read an article where you said if actually everyone played for their heritage side, right? Whether that's Tonga, Samoa, whether that's Fiji, whatever. You know, we've seen it actually in the Rugby Union World Cup at the moment. Yeah. Fiji's performance, unbelievable, Unreal. right? Incredible. Um, that the World Cups would, would become far more competitive. They wouldn't be Australia, New Zealand, England dominant. I mean, whether that's going to happen and yeah. financially, there are, so, there are so many reasons, but in a fairy tale world, what, what an idea that is, John. Yeah, that, that would be one thing the international game, I think, should push for mm. um, because it makes the competition just so much better. You see the, the likes of the boys that came back for Samoa this year, mm. um, the guys that have gone back to Tonga last year, um, the difference it makes to the game. Obviously, uh, when we played Great Britain, a lot of the boys went back for Tonga and they created history that you, they beat Great Britain, but then they also beat Australia, um, which no one gave them a chance. Mm. But um, what they have done as a collective and as a group um, has inspired a lot of other Polynesian and Pacific players to actually, you know what, let's go do this for Samoa, let's go do this for Fiji, let's go do this for PNG. Um, and it, it just makes the competition so, so much better. Um, and I think that's where the international game should go to. Um, but then again, you always always have that financial thing that mm. yeah, that's that the thing. On. I think the financial thing is massive because, as Andrew Fafita touched on um, on the last podcast, him and Jason Tomalola were the, were the pioneers. They were the first two big names to kind of commit mm. their their future, international future, to Tonga. Now I think it's up to the governing body of the NRL, the Super League, and the International Rugby League to to really back that decision because. I think it's 50 grand to play for State of Origin per game. Mm. Probably similar to to play a couple of games or a series for Australia or New Zealand for England. So they should spread that wealth through to the smaller nations. What do you get for Samoa, Tonga? Uh, when I was in Samoa, we got maybe uh, 1,800. Chocolate cheese. There you go. <laughs> so it's not, it's, it's, it's not much. And, and Look, lads, not, lads shouldn't have to take depends. pay cuts to represent the, the country of their heritage. Mm. It's yeah, not on the same Tonga. scale as obviously Samoa and Tonga. Mm. When I played for Ireland in the <laughs> 2017 World Cup, we got given $210 a week. So we got paid dollars, not even dollars. pounds. So we got what? 800 we were there for four weeks. We got $840 for a month. Like wow. most of the boys were getting it in the round in Cairns, crossing mm. the road and putting it in the casino. He was mm. gone in about three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it was, you know, so so I agree with what you're saying, Flash, but unfortunately, I don't think the game has got the money to, to distribute it out, you but, know, to spread it but, out properly. But, but I don't but, think players play a state of origin off for New no, Zealand, they don't play Australia. For they don't play for I, money. I wouldn't have thought so, no. But I think that's why it should be, it should help the developing nations. And whether it is for match fees or whether it is for grassroots roots mm, development mm. in those countries, getting more participation, funding junior teams to, so that there's a there's a, there's a a pyramid, a bigger pyramid at the bottom for the for the rugby league in general because mm. that's, that's one thing that holds it back is the participation around the world. And mm. the developing nations of Tonga, Samoa, Fiji, Papua New Guinea is, is a real opportunity because in other sports they don't have strong those countries don't have that strong we should have a heritage identity. world cup should we yeah well, it should be all in the same mm. but like I say with rugby union you look at rugby union the international mm. game how popular that is yeah now we need to get league into a place where it's not just you know England or Great Britain Australia New Zealand we now got Samoa Fiji I'll throw a Papua New Guinea in there I think yeah. the rate that the, the rate that they're developing players and climbing a lot of players now in the NRL from Papua New Guinea and aren't they on about putting aside aren't they on, yeah. Aren't they on yeah, about that's one, of the, yeah, one yeah. of the sides that so are trying I, to get you know, in I, I think that I agree 100% with what John's saying the more we can get these nations up and running and mm. I mean up and running by in terms of competing in games you know regularly uh, particularly around World Cups then it's only better for the international game and that that's how you get more eyes on it. If you, if you go into a start of a World Cup and there's genuinely five teams that could win it, mm. well, it makes it miles more yeah, interesting, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, d just quickly on that, did you ever do you ever think about playing for Australia as a kid? Was it just was that never in your mindset? Um, um, as a kid, I mean, I didn't even think I was going to play NRL. To be honest, but um, you were playing NRL quite young, weren't you? Well, I, I debuted at 21. Mm. Uh, I just turned 21. Um, but obviously, I didn't. I didn't make any websites till I was 17. Yeah. Um, I got injured, got to like 122 kgs. Yes. Oof. I uh, was going to give up the game as a young kid. How did um, you get to 122 kgs? So I, Easy. my first year, <laughs> my, my first, I was playing rep. My first year playing rep football at Parramatta, 
uh, I did my ankle uh, before the the week before the grand final. Yeah. Um, I was playing six, um, and then I at the time I just didn't know anything about nutrition. I had no clue that's, what to eat. I mean, that's heavy. So, just to put that in perspective, like because you're, I mean, he's, you he's six foot. One oh five. He's six foot. You're not, yes, you're not tall, just tall, under. tall, tall. He's five eleven. So that, that's, that's the weight <laughs> of. Um, <laughs> he's five eleven. <laughs> just no, under. I'm five eleven, and I checked. He's just a little bit taller than me. But so that's that's a that's a George Burgess weight. 122 kilos on a bad oh, day. I think he's a bit more than that. <laughs> I think, he got, that's, that's I think he got invited to too many Tonga weddings with pigs there. I think, I think that's what Piggy it was. Yeah, 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 I think he was just eating the pigs. Um, hungi. Yeah, it's like a hungi or umo. Umo, that's yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned your siblings and so on, so let's just rewind right yeah, back because yeah. I, I want to go through sort of your life and your career in the NRL, which was a really good one before yep. you came over to, to Lee. Um, Siblings, sisters, brothers, mum. Just paint the picture of the of the young Asiata family. For yeah, us. yeah. Um, I've got an older sister that's six years um, older than me, and then it's myself and my younger brother. Mm -hmm. uh, there's only three. Um, my younger brother's two years two years younger than me. Um, yeah, just just us three. Um, obviously, my mum did it tough with me. Um, um, she sort of struggled through her pregnancy with with me because I was too big. Um, oh, yeah. Obviously, you can see the size of my head. It's I, do, I didn't want to bring it up. So you were, um, big, you were right. a big baby yeah, as well, I was a big, big young baby. boy. Um, oh, I was yeah. a big baby. I, I really, yeah, didn't didn't help my mum out there with the size of my head. But <laughs> um, yeah, uh, just us three growing up. Um, but we were always really close with our cousins. Uh, my uncle was, uh, he had nine kids and we were all around the same age. So nine kids? Yeah, so we were all around the same age. Uh, his oldest was two years older than me. Then he had one, uh, one year older than me. Then there was me, and then he had a young, uh, third son that was one year younger than me. Then it was my brother, and then he had a daughter. And did then you, did you get all these people Christmas presents and birthday cards and stuff? That's a yeah, that's, we found a way. Up, go, Guys, we just found a way. Send um, a text message. Yeah, we found a way to 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 look after everyone, um, <laughs> parents, and you know my uncle and everyone. They. They worked really, really hard to to provide for us. Um, didn't matter what time it was. Didn't matter what time they had to go to work. They were there. They were sick. They would go. Um, so the lifestyle that I, uh, the way that I grew up was um, just work hard. Doesn't matter what obstacle, what troubles come your way. You mm. just got to keep going. Just keep going. What were your dreams as a kid? As a kid, uh, I was always to play um, NRL. Um, I also dreamed to be a police officer at one stage, um, but yeah, it was always to play uh, first grade. Um, my uncle and my dad sort of pushed me really hard as a kid, um, but as coming up, um, you know, 16, 17, I, I was still struggling to make rep teams. I, I never really, I never made any um, teams. I had a cousin that um, that I looked up to, which is my uncle's older son. Mm -hmm. Um, he he should have played NRL. Um, he, he was yeah, he was a talent, and sort of made a few mistakes along the way. And I seen that, and then I sort of went down a different path. Um, obviously, his his dad ended up taking me in, and just trained me and made sure that I didn't do the same. Um, yeah, was I that get, a bit of a sliding doors moment when, if your cousin was kind of going down a different path, you just kind of. Went that, the that, other that, way. that was a chance for you to kind of go the other way and it, that propelled you to the next level. Yeah, 100%. Um, because I've seen how hard he worked and who he had to compete with, um, so he came through with the likes of Blake Austin, Matt Moylan from back home, mm -hmm. um, and they he was probably one of the best front rowers at the time. Um, but when he went down this road and chose the, a different life, it made me realise... I can't do that. If I want to play top grade footy, I've got to go this other way. Yeah. And um, very similar to the Fafitas, isn't it, Carla? We had on the yeah. weeks ago, wasn't yeah. it? They said the same thing that they they kind of they could see people yeah. go down that path and how easy it was to go down there, even if you didn't want to go down there. You were yeah. like sucked into a black hole almost. Hundred percent. It's it's like like I was never I was never the strongest um, player. I was never the fittest player. Um, the one thing that I had was skill. And brains, I was. It's a big head. There's got to be some brains in there. Hundred percent. So I was football smart, 
and I understand what I needed to do on the field. And that's what sort of got me around the park most of the time. Where did that Where did that understanding of the game come from? You know, talk about that skill set. That's just something that you've always had. Or who who was the biggest influence in developing you in that as a young kid? Yeah, I think it's just local touch footy. Um, a lot of us used to just go down to this field and just play touch footy, Oz tag. Um, we'll play proper league tackle. Um, and these were run by the likes of Michael Jennings, guys that were in NRL. So after training, they'll come on their days off, they'll set out a field and then we'll just play touch for like hours. Um, and those guys will play with us and then we just sort of learn just by watching. Just it's a by great watching. scouting network. And, and that's, that's the way yeah. we did it. And they still do it now. Um, the likes of Jerome Luai and, you know, Stephen Crichton, they drive that back home. Yeah. Um, a lot of young guys, so in the off season, they run their own pre-season sort of prep. Um, for all those young guys and it would be like skill based stuff and I think that's how I learned was just I just go down on the park play with a lot of guys that were you know four times older than me um, had more experience um, and we'll play from like the age of 11 10 12 um, young kids would join in it didn't matter what age you were just come play I used to do that with my dad and his mates so from being probably 12 to 16 17 my dad and all his group of mates and all the old boys just played touch rugby and I used mm. to do it all the time and I was the youngest there but I think you understand like timing and depth and a spatial awareness just but you learn from all you, you learn a few cheap shots and tricks along the way but I think mm. that extracurricular training can have such a big impact as a, on a young man because th all those more hours you do passing catching the ball creating overlaps I think as you get older it becomes much easier and confidence it? right because you're playing yeah. with big lads yeah. And, yeah well there's not many there's not many people in the game who are built your weight 105 kilo six foot and have the hands of a halfback is this so it's a very very mm -hmm. unique skill set you have really I can't really think of too many other players who have that quality of how you've been playing particularly over the last you know couple of seasons yeah. you've been you know almost that extra half back really but with an ability to carry the ball it, you know and obviously you know there's no for me there's no uh, there's no secret why Lee have had such a good year you know with, with yourself and Lachlan Lamb mm. you know particularly that left edge it, it, it's it's pretty it's been pretty lethal hasn't it yeah, so yeah. Um, no it's obviously done well all that stuff at Penrith yeah, <laughs> yeah. well I want to talk about Lee a bit l l later on but when you think of um, uh, you mentioned it there, like playing sort of 16 years old, 17 years old, it wasn't quite going to work out for you. You, you. you must have thought it wasn't going to happen, right? You were sort of turned away, am I right? And same by Parramatta and by Sydney Roosters before you got to North Queensland Cowboys. Were you thinking that you might have to go down a different route, find a different career? Um, when I got into 20s, I, I didn't believe, I, I did believe that I, I could make it. Um, it was when I was 16, 17, those younger age, I didn't, at the time, making a development squad was big mm -hmm. um, because you see a lot of a lot of young kids that are in your team or um, a bit older than you rock, um, turn up you know to school change into their rep gear catch a train to training and then there's you just catching a train go home um, that was hard to see for me as a young kid but as I started to you know uh, grow older I started to understand um, more about you know it's never finished. Um, the what you want to make of yourself is never going to end unless you really give up. Um, so that was what my dad and my uncle sort of um, sort of pushed me was they because the way that I was growing up is you never give up on anything no matter what it is, mm -hmm. um, and they they drained that into me. They drilled that into me to to make sure that you know no matter if I wasn't fit enough, I'll just keep running until. I finish, mm. like just never stop. Um, and as a kid, um, I used to think, oh, I'm not good enough because I'm not getting picked. Um, I'm not good enough because that guy's fitter than me or that guy's stronger than me. Um, it wasn't until I hit 20s is that I, I started to understand, okay, I'm here for a reason. I can do this. Um, I just need to keep going, don't stop. Um, so when I turn up the training uh, for 20s, um, I was given one thing, one rule, um, that I was to come back at 111. If I didn't come back at 111, I'm gone. Down from what? 122? Two, two. From 122. Two. Which club was that? Roosters. Roosters. So I was given that ultimatum that if you come back and you're not under 111, mm -hmm. you're cut straight away. You don't even get to train 20s. And how long do you have to... to three weeks. Three, three weeks. weeks to lose what? 11 three kilos? Weeks. Yeah. Jeez. So I had a trial match for... For Roosters, um, we played 
West Tigers. They can't do that. Um, so That's mad. Yeah. It's dangerous, it's crazy. isn't it? It's dangerous, yeah. It's crazy, I could do it with that now. What, how did he do it? Saunas? What did he do? Obviously, Man, I, I cut just the trained, out. I just trained junk. my... My uncle would pick me up in the morning, train me in the morning. I'll go to school, come back, train me again in the afternoon. I did that every single day. I got down to 110. So you weighed in and they literally weighed you in I and then accepted you? Yeah. So and you trained twice training, a day for three weeks? Pretty much. <laughs> oh, my God. Didn't stop. He took me everywhere that I needed to go, whether it was road runs. He would drive next to me mm. and he would just drive slow while I'm running. What amazing. It's like and a rocky me, film. Me and, yeah. me and, his, me and um, his son, we used to do that just flat. Amazing. We just keep going. Yeah. So there's a lot of, you know, my whole career has been about working hard because him and my old man pushed me so much. I love that. I'm yeah. not too, I'm not sure there's too many, and I don't mean to sound way way older than my time. I don't think now there's too many young lads who'd be able to do that. Mm. Do you, or who'd have who would the want to have the to desire. Do, yeah, yeah. Yeah, do you know what I mean? I don't I don't think that you know, that's pretty uh, that's, that's, but you painted the picture there of where that comes from, which is why I'm so glad we started with you know, the heritage side of things and, you know, and, and, and your family members pushing you and pushing you. But you, you wouldn't be able to do that if it wasn't for what you had up there as well. Yeah. So when you finally put on that, that Cowboys jersey and turned out in the NRL and made your debut, because you said that was your dream. Yeah. Take us back to that moment, walking out in that stadium, looking at that crowd. Yeah, it was, um, it was very surreal. Um, obviously, I went to Cowboys and I was injured. So I had an operation and... Didn't know how I was going to go. Greeny sort of gave me a chance to just, you know what, come with me. I'll take you. Um, and just work hard. That's all you need to do. And then I did that. And then he told me that I was making my debut. I told my old man and, um, you know, we shared some tears because this is what we dreamed of. Um, so my whole family made the trip. Um, and, yeah, it was unreal. The speed of the game. Um, we played Melbourne Storm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the speed of the game was fast. And because of me, you know, I just sort of chase everything. That's what I did. I think I lasted five minutes and I was gone. That was like that, mate. I think it was just, for me, when I got told I was making that debut, it was it was like, thank you to my dad. Like in my mind was just, Thank you to my dad. Thank you to my uncle for pushing me and believing in me. Mm. That and belief's massive, isn't it? It is. It is. And that's what's it's been driving me through my whole career because um, there's a lot of people that I know that never really gave me a chance. Um, but it was all about me and, you know, do I believe in myself to be able to overcome this? Do I believe in myself to, you know, play 80 minutes? Do I believe in myself to come back from an injury? Um, those are the things that play in your mind mentally. And I think as a young kid, learning a lot from my old man and what they did for me um, sort of sort of shaped me the way I am today, the way I think, the way I approach, you know, just life in general. We've we've interviewed now a few get well since I've been coming along and one thing that's a common theme amongst the players that we've spoken to mm. is that belief, whether it's from a coach, one person obviously your father in this case, but one person in your career flash can have a huge, huge effect on the on the outcome of, of, of where you are good in that moment. Good and bad, right? Yeah, mm. good and bad, yeah. And it's just crazy, isn't it? You know, that that, that so many people... You, 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 look, you look across stars of all games and, and when you hear them saying about how the lack of the self-belief or well, the needed belief in them... I think, young, I think yes, young men are so impressionable, aren't they? Had John been put in that position and said, you've got to lose 10 kilos in, in three weeks. Had he gone home that night or been to your uncle's? Mm. There's a bit, there's so many parents and, and uncles who probably look and go, oh, you'll never do that. Mm. And that could have been the end of his career. Yeah, or think about a, a different something else, maybe yeah, a plan B. Dad, and, work that 10 kilos in three well, weeks. Well, you've got no chance you've of doing that. You've got no chance, don't worry about it. Yeah. Mm. And then that that could be, your that fork in the junction, that could be your career ended and you go and do something different. But that one moment of, come on, we can do this. Get your training. And I think, we'll I think you're run. right. I think Carl's just, right. It just can take you off on different, different young, journeys. Young guys these days, young girls, sports women, sports men, don't necessarily, that's a massive sweeping generalisation. Yeah. It just feels, doesn't it, that they don't, that yeah. there's a lot of, that they wouldn't have that determination. They wouldn't have that sort of grit to be able to dig in and go, do you know what, I'm going to fucking do this and prove yeah. everyone wrong. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I just think that, that you know, um, having young kids myself now and and having worked in a school for a year i kind of seen the through lazy my own kids are lazy. No, look, look, look. they <laughs> are the lazy the, 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 everyone's the, lazy the, these they days they are but but i've seen it the biggest thing i felt was was <laughs> the, the biggest thing i felt was the the, the 
they're just not resilient anymore. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, and I just wonder where the snowflakes. Every, mm. we're, we're, they're flaky. Everyone falls yeah. apart, and the first bit of criticism get flicked. Oh, That's I'll it, go back know. into my yeah. little cage. I'm old school, my boys. Yeah, Went good. to a play centre with Freddie, and he was trying to climb. He had a ball in his hand. He tried climbing up this like soft play ladder, and he kept falling. He kept looking to me to pick him up. I was like, "No way, you can, mm. you can do it." Yeah. And he did it in the end, but. This is, I'm, three hours. I'm not so he to... might be sat on a podcast in 20 years' time exactly. saying it was my dad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was my, my dad. dad. I remember when I was two. <laughs> if he caught was me snide. off that climbing frame, I'd have never been Prime Minister. <laughs> 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 um, th this story just it goes to another level, doesn't it? And I'm, I'm not, we're not over-egging the pudding here, John, right? Because you've made your debut in the NRL, the dream. It's come true. Amazing day for, for you and your family. But then a year later, you're playing in the NRL Grand Final for the Cowboys, I remember watching this, I think, with you, Mark, the, against the, the Broncos, right? 2015, Golden Point Extra Time, 17-16. Incredible, incredible game, which has gone, gone down in history in, in the NRL. And and you win the grand final. I mean, <laughs> it. how old are you at that point? 20... Oh, just, I would have just turned 22. 22? Yeah. I mean, it can't get better than play. that, can it? You uh, played front row. No, I came off the bench, lock off the bench. Lock yeah. off the yeah, bench. Yeah. Yeah. But that's as, that's as big as it ever gets. Yeah. Um, magic just magical really the the whole sort of lead up into into the grand final um but as a young kid there's not many people that play the game of nrl and say they've played in a grand final or won a grand final mm -hmm. but for me to be able to be there my second year like as a kid i'm like man this is this is the dream this is what we you know as a young kid you dream about playing nrl let alone playing in the biggest stage um but then you know Cowboys, Brisbane Broncos, never been done before. Mm. Um, Golden Point win, never been done before. It was just history all over. But mm. it's it's a game that, you know, um, that I just, like, there was so much going on through my head throughout the whole game. Yeah. Um, don't stuff up. Don't make an error. Like, it, there were so many things. And the game was that close that I think my belief and my faith, I want to touch back on that because... There's in, in the grandstand, my wife was standing next to my old man. And this is how strong my dad is when it comes to believing and just his faith in things will happen. Um, my wife was just going nuts. Like, we're not going to win this. We're not going to do this. <laughs> and my dad's just so calm. He just goes, hey, don't worry. We're going to win. Don't worry about it. And then literally when he said that, she said, Jonathan Furston gives the ball to Michael Morgan. Morgan goes down the sideline, gives it to Felty, score in the corner. <laughs> and she's like, what the <laughs> hell? <laughs> like, it's, just, it's just what what my dad is built on and what I've been built on because I was praying on the sideline. As I do, I just sit there, I close my eyes, I just sort of just talk to myself. And it's just belief, man. And, you know, that's how we won that game is, is our team didn't give up. We, we played right to the end and, and that's what's driving us here at Lee and that's what we've built as a club is just believe in what we've done, believe in the prep that we've done and like I see this season very similar to how 2015 was. Mm. Um, I know we're not at the grand final but it's you know just the build up all the way through the year. Um, it's just all about believing mm. and just trusting the process, trusting what we need to do as a team trust your players next to you that they will do their job and, and that's that's how we've built such a great you know a great team even though no one gave us a chance so just on that grand final you talked about when you'd done your nrl debut what mm. dad and uncle were like what was he like after a grand final with them? <laughs> he was buzzing <laughs> i can't say buzzing steve maiden's got me saying buzzing all the time <laughs> um yeah he was over the moon like um it's it's very hard to explain his emotion, but there was just tears um, from my uncle, from my dad, um, from myself. Everyone was just, you know, emotionally drained because we just never, we never thought that, you know, as a young kid from Andrew, going to be in a team to win the grand final so early in his career. That, um, that's what I wanted to ask you about, actually, because... When you've got there, and I guess I said it to you earlier, that yeah. you feel like you've you've done it, you've completed everything, you've, done, you've you've won the grand final. Does it make you hungry? And look, we've we've all been to a grand final here, haven't we, Mark? Carl's been yeah. to a few. I've been to a couple as a fan. You've been you've played half back in one, didn't you? Yeah. And you lost, lost the other one against Saints. We'll talk about. But in all seriousness, does it does it make you hungry, or do, or do you? Is there a side at all which goes, 
do you know I've lost a bit of kind of done it and nothing feels like that again afterwards no no if, if anything that makes you want to go for it again like obviously I've won one now um but obviously I'm here now in the UK I want to do the same here with this team mm. I want to be able to you know lead these boys out into a grand final uh, we've done that in the challenge cup and done it this year mm. um, which was amazing but you know, we still have that urge to, you know, we can go and get this this next one. Um, what are those days I, like, though? I mean, you, you two, I mean, you, how many have you been to? You've been, you're a greedy pig. You've been to how many? Four. Four, and you've won all four? Yeah. Oh, so, but, 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 but what I was saying is, it's interesting when John says that, because obviously it's team sport, isn't it? Mm. So when you win one, I think there is, there is a almost... Oh, we've done it now. We've done it. So two didn't so, feel so, quite as no, no. It, it was a different. It was a different journey. You know, the first one. It's more relief. I think when you win a grand final, for me, it was more like I've done it. Mm. I've done what I set out to do. It's over. Do you know what I mean? So, like you've got through the game. You haven't cost the error or anything. Thank God for that. You know, mm. you've done. And obviously, you're then celebrating whatnot after it. But I think, I think to to back it up, I don't think people realise how difficult it actually is to, to then, for a group of men, not just yourself, you, you could by, by all means go, right, I've got it, I'm hungry, I want it again and again and again, why wouldn't you not? Yeah. But to get a group of men to actually really believe in it and buy into it and want to go again and again and again, mm. that's the hard part, do you know what I mean? So individually, everybody would always say it, but the actual getting a group of blokes to find another level to go again, that's the hard part. There's a big gap between since his first and second wasn't yeah, it and yeah. then there was five, years, yeah, it? five years yeah. and then you went on a run of four in a row yeah. just wondering how, how, how that dynamic of wanting not wanting it enough after the first one but then opposed to the second third fourth fifth was such such a big well there was accumulation of things you know you go back to 2017 Luke Gale knocks us out with a drop goal yeah. heartbreak then because Justin Albrook came in we were ninth took us to a semi-final of a uh, in a playoff game and we got beat the way we did. Then 2018, we got beat. We were, I think, we'd won the the league by a record points margin. Got beat by Warrington when we all thought we were favourites. 2019, we then lost the Challenge Cup final. So there was a little bit of there was a bit of hurt, but obviously all the ingredients came at the right time. You had the international players, your Wormsleys, Lomax, uh, making some Percival, all in probably the peak years of their career. And you just felt that the, that the heartache or the or, or the the suffering we went through, losing in ways we did, it just it just sparked the fire flash really when and then beat, once when you we sold for it in that one did you go up to mark and go ha ha wank <laughs> no, no 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 you don't, you don't, you don't do no, that no you don't do that yeah. you, you, no, what's the same you saying bolt does bury them with a smile <laughs> yeah. and, and so, not dickheads either uh, but, 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 no but I think I think from then on it was a it was a combination of all that and then look we were a very there was a lot of us who had who had been in the team and and I think with the, with the clubs like St Helens you've got lads who were born and bred round there and who really 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 invested in it. I'm not saying that people who aren't born and bred where they play aren't as invested, but it just everything just came at the right time again off the off the sort of the losses that we had. Mm. It was ju you just felt it. You just felt something special was happening. Whether that we all knew it was going to be three and four years in a row, now they're going for five. Whether they Same. actually believed that, mm. but again, right at the top of it all was a was an older leadership group that that just drove those standards. Yeah, yeah. So that's what that, yeah yeah. How, how different are the days though? Like you, you've been there, won it, and lost it at Old Trafford, and you've lost one against Melbourne, right? Yep, twenty seventeen. So I mean, I'm just thinking, was your dad there going? Don't worry we win this one and he didn't you know like how, how different was that day for you um very different because oh the way we got there um we were only ninth we we're sitting ninth and we had to wait for the last game i think bulldogs had to beat dragons by a certain amount of points and then that's how we scraped in so i think dragons are winning um so the boys started drinking more we we're at the pub watching it they started drinking <laughs> thinking we we're going to be on mad monday Bulldogs came back and beat them by, I think it was like six or seven points. And then we ended up making the eight. Um, so every game from then on was just, let's just go out there and have a crack. Like, let's just have a dig. We beat Canola Sharks, then we beat Parramatta, and then we went to Roosters, beat Roosters, and ended up in the GF. Mm. And no one expected anything of us that year because we didn't have Jonathan Thurston. We lost him. We lost Matt Scott. Um, so the team was run by Michael Morgan, led us around the park. So no one sort of gave us a chance because we were down on big, big men. But then obviously as a team, we're like, we can do this if we just make sure that every game is just 100 miles an hour. Mm. Just give it your all. And if we win, 
we win, we carry on. If we lose, at least we we had a crack. Yeah. Is that is that? I mean this in the right way. Is that similar with Lee? Because Lee came up from the championship, right? And I, well, when you looked at the squad, you knew they weren't going to finish bottom. But I don't think anybody quite envisaged the year that you've had. Is that was the, have you sort of helped pass on some of those similar messages? Like, because it just seems that like I think at the start of the year, when Lee were winning games, it was like, all right, we'll wait for them to fall away, and the, and you know they're quite a small squad, and everybody had stuff ready for when you did fall, but you just haven't really gone away. Like it's you know, no, I think I think our whole preseason this year was just built around just hard work and just you know effort, um, and then also just believing in who we have. Like we we all understood that we weren't, you know, um, a lot of boys came from teams that people call them rejects. Um, but then also a lot of boys, um, you know, uh, were young. We didn't have a big squad. Um, and then obviously the boys that were there last year, we understood that we built a pretty good foundation for those boys to come into. Um, last year was all about, you know, building something that we can hold on to um, and moving into Super League, which is all about belief. Um, and that was always there in 2022. Um, coming into 23 was making sure that we can pass on that message to those other guys. And it's, it's not something that I've driven or something that Lamy has brought in. It's a collective. Um, it's a collective thing that we've all agreed on, which is, which I, which is why I think we're going so well is because everyone has actually bought into what we want to achieve mm. this year, no matter what other people say, no matter what the critics say, no matter who's typing and say, oh, these guys are fluking their way through this year. Um, I think in the beginning of the year, I I said we will finish in the top six. Um, and then most of the boys were like, oh, we'll see. But I said, mate, we're going to finish top six and I need you to believe it because that's what's going to happen. If you put your mind to it, and this is what I've said to a lot of our boys, especially our younger guys. So if you put your mind to the things that you want to achieve, you will achieve it in some way. Um, but if you doubt yourself for one second, that's all gonna go. But our boys are bought in this year and it's a, it's a credit to everyone from the top room staff all the way down to the players. Everyone's just, you know, it starts from Derek. Derek has done a lot of changing within the club. Um, what he's done to, you know, promote the game, but then also the entertainment that he's brought into Lee Sports Village. It just makes the game for us feel more, you know, more alive and more, you know, gives the boys more urge to, you know, you let's go play for our fans, let's go play for each other. Like it just makes us more eager to just get out there and just rip in. I just want to finish off your time in the NRL quickly because yeah. you made 128 appearances for um, for the Cowboys, which is pretty good going, right? And some incredible memories there. Um, just quickly, why why did it not work out at Brisbane? In Brisbane? Um so I ended up doing my neck in Brisbane. Um, I had a I had my C6 disc removed mm -hmm. um, in round 17, I think it was. I uh, I sort of lost all feeling from my waist down or my upper half to my waist. I um, I couldn't feel my hands. Both arms were gone. I, I was knocked out at the time. Um, when I woke up, it probably took me about 30 to 40 minutes to get my feeling back. Um, so once I got my my op done. Um, they went into a bubble and then I wasn't put in that bubble. I was left outside the bubble. So all my rehab was done just on my own. Um, but then, you know, obviously Kevin and, and the, the team there wanted to go a different way with me, um, which I accepted. And yeah, I just that had to move That must have been on. incredible. You, you glossed over it then. That must have been an incredibly scary experience to come off a rugby field. You're probably on a stretcher and you can't feel your fingertips or from from your from your torso down yeah what, very what scary. was that like yeah at the time i didn't know too much about it because i was knocked out so it wasn't until i was in the ambulance that i woke up and i realized i just could not move very scary uh, for my wife especially and my family um it was actually the first game that my dad went to at suncorp stadium <laughs> was it oh wow. um, so he's not going back yeah but um yeah it was very scary because it happened in round one yeah. The first one happened in round one, and then I ended up making, well, the ser the specialist said, I think you should go get your op. And I said, oh, give me one more chance. So they made me a neck brace. So I wore one very similar to Brent Tate's neck brace yeah, that I had. Well. So I had that for a couple of rounds. And I didn't you like played it. nine more games, I think, didn't you? 
Yeah, I played a fair few more games after that. Yeah. yeah. But I ended up playing with a neck brace probably for four games and I brushed it because it just wasn't working for me. I, I don't know what the biblical reference is, um, and I, but I can't imagine, Mark, that there's a God that would send someone to Whitehaven. Whitehaven. Oh, Whitehaven. Is that, is, so he comes hey, over hey. from a. It's a. I don't know if anyone's it's been. A it's a, it's a fucking shit. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 We got him. 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 We got him like a kipper. We got him like a kipper. Because that. So you come over from beautiful playing the Sun Cop Stadium. Beautiful. You know Brisbane and a little bit of. You know we obviously Cowboys for years and the Bulldogs. And then you're the in a leash away. Yeah, away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it makes Black, I mean, it makes Blackpool look like the Kings Road in Chelsea. Whitehaven. I'm, I'm going to walk out. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, what, in all seriousness, what was that yeah. experience? Because that is, and it's worked out unbelievably. And look yeah. what you've done yeah. with Lee this year. Look where you're going with Lee. But come on, when you first started, you must have thought, God, what's God doing to me here? This is a test, isn't yeah. it? He doesn't like me very much today. <laughs> well, I, I, like you said, it, is this a test? Everything that we do in life, especially for myself and the way I live my life, everything is a test. Mm. Um, I always live by Philippians 4.13, which says, I can do all things in God. He gives me strength. Um, Mark 9, um, 23, or Mark 4.23, sorry. Um, if you believe, all things will happen. Um, and, and that's the way I live my life. I believe that God has the plan. The plan is done. Like he's already written my script. Um, but it's for me to believe in him that that script is for me. Um, it's not for me to go and just try and, uh, I think this is better for me, God. I'm just going to step over here and, you know, I'm going to go do this. How did that script happen, though? Like, is, was it Derek Beaumont? Was it a Zoom call? Because a lot of the times, you know, we've spoken to so many people on this podcast who've come from the NRL, and it, it literally is like a sort of, you know, it's Daryl Powell on a Zoom call for 10 minutes over the coffee trying to convince you to come over or something, you know. Yeah, it's, How it's did funny. that work with Derek and Lee? It's funny that you mention that because I was actually going to sign with York. Oh, well, yeah. I was about to sign with York. I, I spoke to, I think it was John. Uh, no, not John Ford. He was the um, he was where Clint is now, um, the chair, the, the CEO. Yeah. So it was before Clint. Um, I spoke to him and I said, "Oh, I want to come to York," but I didn't write no sign or anything. It was just sort of word of mouth. But then um, my wife sort of sat me down and said, "I need you to be honest with me." Do you want to just go and just you know just play footy because of what's happened and you just want to go have fun and just travel or do you want to go and play serious do something with the rest of your career that you you have and and just have a crack again and i said i sat there for a bit and i sort of thought about it and i was like okay i want i want to have a crack and then the next day derek calls me derek calls me he said i want you to come let me calls me i believe that you're something that we need for this club and that's how it happened was there ever a, a Super League offer or, or was it always just the, the championship? Because obviously having two grand finals under your belt yeah, in the I NRL, found, you, yeah. you, you would surely think that there'd be some Super League. When I heard that he'd signed for Lee, I was like, well, Super League clubs have missed, yeah, yeah. missed opportunities. Was there, was there ever any, any interest from them? Yeah, or was there, it? there was two. Um, whole KR was one. Yeah. Um, but then obviously they sort of stuck to the whole process of because I didn't get the jab. Right, they, so they that, 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 put, that, that so, must have been so that pulled pulled the whole cow yeah, away. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but then Castleford was another one, mm -hmm. um, but they wanted me to play back row. Um, and I said, no. I said, I like playing in the middle. I want to be in the middle to play because I like to get my hands on the ball. Wow. Um, and I ended up going to Lee. What was that conversation like with, just to give us a bit of insight with Adrian and Derek? Was Derek wearing his leopard suit on the call? <laughs> nah, no yeah. call. It, was, it wasn't even a FaceTime. It was, it was just a phone call, um, and we spoke nothing about rugby league. Nothing, absolutely nothing. It had nothing to do with rugby league. Because you're a very we different spoke... character to Derek. You know, he's a bit, he's yeah. eccentric. <laughs> he's yeah. got, he's he's got, got, he owns leopards now, right? Yes, yep. he owns some leopards, like Mike Tyson. Am I, am I hearing he that was, right? He has a sanctuary. It, it wouldn't surprise. Yeah. Me. He's got leopard sanctuary. Yeah, yeah. it's like a yeah with uh, rhinos. He's got rhinos with as well. Rhinos. Is, he, is he Leeds? Is he going to Leeds? Uh, no, no, no. He's got, Ryan, he's got I, all I, the animals. I just, just had like a picture of him. Like the Tiger King. <laughs> <laughs> head like the Tiger King. <laughs> but with leopards. Has he got wild cats as well? He's got all the animals uh, according it's to. Not wild cats anymore. Well, Saint Helens, Saint Bernard. Saint There's no animal after Saint. It's a Saint boy, isn't it? Yeah. So our phone call was. It was more to do with charity work. What I like to do in person, like besides footy, I like to help you know young kids. I like to go out and help the community, and that was our conversation and 
that's where I decided to go to Lee because mm. of what he does off the field that people don't know of. Um, a lot of the people that he supports, a lot of things that he does in the community, that's what sort of drove me to come here. Can mm. you enlighten us though? Because I, I've never heard, heard of stuff that Derek does in the community. We want him on the pod, Mark, don't we? we do you want to make do, another do. appeal? Because he wouldn't come on when Wilkin was here because they hated each other, but now Wilkin's gone. And actually, they, ironically, they've well, become quite good friends, haven't they? I've, uh, yeah, sorry, just just on that. Yeah. That your, your thing, so I nearly signed for Lee in 2019, right? Did you? Yes, so uh, John Dufty picked me up and he took me to Lee Sports Village. So my conversation with Derek Bourne was a little bit different. And I, come, <laughs> I actually text him after the Challenge Cup final, right? Because I'll get to that in a sec. But he, uh, so he sat me down and he told me for about half an hour, so before we even talked anything about rugby, told me for half an hour how he'd been away and his yacht was parked next to Conor McGregor's yacht and how he nearly had a fight with his security staff because he wouldn't turn his music down. So very different, very different conversation. I was asking so, about that story so, because I have not heard that. Story. Story. So, and he was showing me, he was showing me, he was showing me the pictures on his yacht. And anyways, and then after that, he said about, uh, and I'll never forget this. And I, I, I literally texted him after the Challenge Cup final. He told me all he ever wanted out of it being at Lee was to be able to walk his side out at Wembley and win a Challenge Cup. And at yeah. this point, they weren't like quite at the top of the championship. And in my head, I thought, you, you're fucking mental. Yeah. Right? Do you know what I mean? And then, and it was about a week later, I decided to stay at Saints and we ended up winning the Challenge Cup final yeah. that, that year. But then when he won it, I shot him a text straight away and he said he could remember me because I had. Peroxide blonde there when I did. it was that you know and uh, yeah so mate you know uh, but uh, he is what the game needs I yeah. think you know what I mean I think he really is and he you delivers you, right and he delivers he's mate, not just a character he's not just a man you know man, and you shit. talk about the belief in fact I actually seen there was something on Twitter doing the rounds where he says we'll be back in 2023 and we'll be taking one of you doesn't he have you seen the little video that's been doing the round on mm, Twitter and, and it. it was yeah so you talk about that inner belief well you yeah. know, he's he's delivered. Incredible. Like I said, it starts from the top, man. And, yeah. And Derek's done that, and it's it's contagious, man. Like if he's believing at the top that we can achieve this, it's just going to rub off everyone else. But you can and see people who've is. rejuvenated their careers there, like Charlie and well, like Hardacre. They've, they've, they've got, got some play. big players there. Who've yeah, got yeah, big they've game got experience, haven't they? Who've had a point to prove. Mm. Tom Briscoe and Zach Hardacre, both yeah. international outside backs who mm. probably weren't wanted by their clubs. Look what it makes. Josh Charlie. Josh Charlie. Josh Charlie. Josh Charlie. Josh Charlie. He was nearly going to give the game up and go back on a building site. Jack Hughes, they've all played at big clubs and told they're not wanted. Well, they've got a reason to win and that's just to prove a point, prove people wrong. Put a talent. You put a talented coach in the Lachlan Lamb, who, who's come from like fringe NRL, who probably wants to show what he can do. Mm. But plays like him, and then some t team cohesion, a bit of team spirit, and a mad owner, and you've got Challenge Cup winners. It, it didn't, didn't seem fair having John though in the championship in a Lee shirt. Did it? it was almost like remember Jonah Lomu the game back in the yeah. day, but you just <laughs> cheated. Yeah, this didn't seem right, yeah. did it? It was like when, I mean, I don't know how much I, you know your union, but it was like, yeah, yeah these, these All Blacks played yeah, for Northampton when they were in the championship. I think he knows who John No, but you know, they, no, no, but it's in like when Northampton were in the championship and they were just walking past teams and battering them by 100 points again. That was what Asiata well, well, was doing, wasn't it? You got to work on, obviously, Premier Sport and uh, doing quite a lot of your games and you were winning like, you know, 70s, yeah. 70s, 60s mm. and it was almost like, you know, I'm more Can you take anything from that? You know, like Space Jam. It was more One or two, which one? One, the original. Yeah. Just going back before Karen, yeah, yeah. What um, <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's Derek, what does Derek do in the um, in the community? Because he's he gets portrayed in the media as this kind of clown. Yeah, yeah, a bit of a clown, and probably just drives around his Lamborghini. But I'm getting getting the impression from you that he, mm. he does a lot more for people than people probably su yeah, suggest and well, perceive. I think Derek is is one of those people that doesn't like to show off and show people that you know I'm doing this for this person, this person, this person. All of that is kept to himself. He just does it of the kindness of his heart and I think that's what um, that drove me the most is because he told me that I don't go out there and promote that I, I do all this stuff I don't just chuck money here I this, do this here and that I keep that to myself because this is what that's what helps me you know keep going every single day is to make sure that I can help different people you know overcome what they're going through and that's what drove me to come to Lee because that's what I love I love helping people I love the community side of things. I love being able to make an impact on someone's life and make, you know, help young ones, you know, fulfill their dreams or help young ones, you know, overcome, you know, being bad on the streets and, you know, making a different choice that they can go and, you know, fulfill a dream that they've always had. Um, but Derek does a lot um, with different people. He does bike riding for raise awareness for charity. 
Um, it goes out to communities. So Compassion and Action is one of the charities that we do with a lot of the veterans as well that we, we turn up and do things for. Um, a lot of the uh, Darien House, we do stuff for them. Um, but he's, there's a lot of things, I probably don't even know all of them, but he's actually got a heart of giving. Um, his heart to help people that people don't see, people only see the passionate Derek that just loves what he does. That's all people see, but there's a there's something in Derek that people don't know about and it's his heart of giving and, and that's what but I can the, say. The, the whole leopard jacket thing, it's a character, isn't it? And he yeah, knows what jacket, he's doing. He knows what he's doing, doesn't he? Yeah. It's a little bit like, you know, Tyson Fury who almost plays <laughs> up to the... Yep. Of course it is. I think it's smart, mate. Do you know Do you what I mean? he had but it on when he was kicking off with Conor McGregor because he would have been wearing some sort of funky gear, wouldn't he, as well? Imagine that. Turn no, that no, he will. He, well, you know, it wasn't Conor, it was Conor McGregor's staff so oh, right. that, it wasn't Conor McGregor no, let's <laughs> yeah, get that one straight no it wasn't Conor, Conor if you're watching and listening <laughs> yeah. it wasn't Derek I, I don't think Conor McGregor is watching need, by the way, we no, do no, 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 it doesn't, no it doesn't podcast. we've got some Sharon Stone tunes Sharon Stone's she's a big fan, witness fan really yeah, yeah. 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 sorry Sharon it was around Basic games. Instinct 2 wasn't it which was yeah, yeah. Tom Hanks has tuned in a couple of times Tom Hanks yeah Sheffield Eagles fan we're running out of shows this season but it's almost a reason to carry on next year to get Derek Berman on this podcast gotta get him on 100% gotta get him on so the story of then like being promoted and getting into Super League, and I'm, I don't know if we can bring Wilkin into this again, but a lot of people tipped you to be relegated, right? Uh, and <laughs> where you are currently right now and what you've done already this season. Um, did that Challenge Cup final feel bigger than 2015? Because it was just as dramatic, wasn't it? A Lachlan Lamb drop goal in extra time. It was time. a very, very similar, um, very similar it was actually the same scoreline as well. It was, 17-16, um, yeah. Exact same scoreline. So the way I looked at his drop kick, very similar to Jono, how he dropped the ball. It wasn't perfect, but he kicked it over, and that's what matters most. But it it's very dramatic, and it is up there with 2015. Um, obviously, because Challenge Cup is, being, is so big here, I had to sort of learn a little bit about it and the mm. importance of it and the history behind it. Um, being able to walk up those stairs to get the trophy, that, like... If I look back at a lot of videos, that's like a dream of a lot of people in Super League. The celebrations were unbelievable, yeah, weren't they? I just watched a clip this morning just to remind myself of it. But when Derek is there, fair play, because a lot of people say, oh, let the players celebrate. But yeah. Derek's been such a big part of it. right? Yeah. And I know we've given Derek a lot of airtime here, but he was straight on. It was a, it was a Beaumont yep. pylon, wasn't it? He ran faster than a lot of our players <laughs> to get on to jump. So, amazing um, scenes, though. Yeah, it was amazing. It, like Credit to Derek because I... Like he, he's done so much in leading up to that preparation to make sure that we didn't have to worry about family. We didn't have to worry about how they're going to get there, mm -hmm. um, where the families are going to stay. Derek took care of all of that um, with their staff, making sure that all we had to focus on was the game. And, and that's what he wanted for us was to make sure the experience for families and friends that were coming was mm. like perfect. And, and I think that was... Um, what he did, he, he delivered with everything he said. How have Lee done this though this season, Mark Kyle? Because you know, with your pundit hats on, do, I mean, you must have tipped them not to be anywhere near the top four. No, now I, th and... I thought they finished about ninth. Will, mm. and, you know, I thought they finish above. Well, I didn't think they were as bad as you know. I didn't think. Well, I looked at Wakefield and Castleford, and you know, the, I, I actually thought Castleford would go down. And a couple of Castleford fans have reminded me this they week far off, they didn't, so I wasn't <laughs> far off. So, but uh, no, I just think what they've got, you know, they've got the, your spines amazing isn't it you, you know you put yourself in there 13 9 6 7 1 have predominantly been out there for most of the season as well and 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 just the way that just the way that you you attack every game don't you do you know what i mean and i think back to that the the one the one game when i actually thought right lee had actually quite seriously it was that semi-final against saints because you had to win in a way that i've never seen lee play you had to you know, you were hit with loads and loads and loads of Saints attack and you still managed to keep them out, didn't you, time and time again. And then you had that 10 minute period in the second half where you just gone bang, bang, and they were stunned. Do you know what I mean? It, it, and it, I hadn't seen a, a team cope with what you had to cope, particularly a Lee side, and then punch them in the face up the other end. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's when I actually thought, you know, Lee could, could actually go all the way and not just in this competition, but in the in the playoffs as well, and uh, you've had that little kind of little wobble after the Challenge Cup final, which is you know which is understandable. Mm, but again, the performance against it. Oh, that was something else I was going to ask you. That against Saints, were you injured? 
or were you because there was a lot of people wondering why you weren't playing in that game yeah yeah um yeah i was injured so after challenge cup final um there was a last 10 minutes of the challenge cup i i chased try to block the uh, drop kick and both my calves went at the time we thought it was cramping um and then i played obviously extra time i ended up playing three weeks after that three games um but the pain still wasn't going away um so i had a scan I had two tears in my soleus, um, so I've been playing with it for three weeks. So yeah, I had, I had so that's why I've been resting. With, with the celebrations after Wembley, madder than a Mad Monday. Are you are you a drinker, Johnny? I don't drink. You don't drink. No, no? I don't drink, and I don't really go to but Mad Mondays. Did, that must you have to be quite patient Smart to decision. go out <laughs> celebrating with. Because I imagine yeah. Josh and Zach had a few few drinkies. Oh, they? everyone did. Yeah, everyone did. <laughs> was it crazy? Yeah, crazy. Yeah, it scenes? was crazy. Can you let it tell us actually, any stories? No, oh, no, not really any stories. We all sort of stayed back at the hotel. We had a function room um, and, you know, all the family and friends were there. Kids were still running around. It was like 2 a.m. in the morning. So kids were still there. Um, it was just it was just very different to the way I thought people would be celebrating. Everyone was on the dance floor, just having a really good time. So um, it's it was a very different celebration to a Mad Monday, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> um, we've got to get into a talking point, haven't we? Because mm -hmm. you mentioned the St. Helens semi-final. Yep. Yep. So obviously we're going to talk about the tackle, yep. which I know you've had a lot of criticism for. Um, first, first thing I wanted to ask you, and Mark, you might know the answer to this, Carl, you might know the answer to this, people listening might know the answer to this. That tackle, have, have you done it before? Did you do it in the NRL before? The tackle around the legs? Yeah. Doing it the my head, whole life. The head to quad, head to wherever you want to call it. Is there a name for it? A grass cut. A grass cut? Yep. So you have, you've, you've tried uh, and you've I've successfully... Done it my whole career. Have you? Yep. And did you, did you get any shit for it before? No. First time. So, so the technique is, and I, and I think Kyle and I and lots of players would have, yep. would have played first grade and... When you when a big ball carrier is is carrying at you and they've got really good leg drive, you go usually go low to to stop that leg drive. Uh, now I think in that match it was Warmsley and Parsi, you went low on and they've ended up having quite bad injuries, haven't they? Yeah. Uh, and you came in for a bit of flack on the back of that. Now I have I don't think having met you, you'd ever want to injure or hurt another player. Yeah. But has it made you think about your technique going forward and and? Not wanting that to happen to a, to another player again, or, or is it something um, you've kind of you're used to, you've done it your whole life, and it was just a, yeah, I, a, an I, accident that went. That kind of. I think it's it's a hard one because I that's how I've tackled my whole life, especially against big big players. We coached to tackle like that as a kid. No, that's no, just just you. A lot of us used to do it um, back home, um, and. Yeah, I've just I've always done it. I think you look back in the Saints game earlier in the year. I think I got Wormsley a couple of times in that game, um, but then the one against Parsi, um, that one probably hurt me a lot more because obviously I just threw my body like th that was. There's two sides yep. of this, John, right? And I've actually defended you on this because yep. and I was talking to Will before. Yep. By the letter of the law, mate, you've done nothing wrong, right? Yep. I don't I don't like the look of the tackle. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's dangerous for you. I think it's dangerous yep. for the play, obviously. Uh, but the other way of looking at this, right, in that game, if you don't, if you don't stop him there, you're out of the Challenge Cup final. Sorry, you're not in the Challenge Cup final. Saints probably score that try and then make it as an easier kick and they're probably going to win that game. And he's done nothing illegal too. he's done nothing it. illegal, right? So your coach, or let's say, maybe not so much you, John, but if you're one of those fringe players, Flash, and you're in that squad heading towards the Challenge Cup final or whatever, and you don't make that tackle, you probably don't play for the rest of that season then, I don't think, because you've cost the club by not throwing your body, you get told to defend your, you defend your line for what for, for whatever it's worth. Again, I must stress, I don't agree. I don't think it's a safe tackle at all. But why has it not been but, banned then across but, anywhere? But I don't think, but until the game changes that 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 letter in the law, mm -hmm. he hasn't done anything But wrong. if John's been doing it in the NRL, and I mean, have you, have you seen a grass cut tackle before? Like I said, we're, we're all taught to go low on big players yeah. because the leg drivers can be devastating. Um, I've never they, gone that low because I probably don't want to get my knocked out. Well, that's I what I mean. Get, I think my wife it, tells me. Have you lot. been knocked out a few times doing that? No, I haven't been knocked Look out. Look at his head. Not, not doing that. Yet. No one's knocking him out. But what I'm saying <laughs> is the way that he goes in and the height that he goes in at, it could be very easily you knocked out. And, and let's say, let's say, okay, let's say the game started, let's say that tackle started coming in more and more. And let's say over the next four, five, six weeks, 12, 15 players got knocked out doing it. The game would then react, wouldn't it? Mm. 
Well, it's, so it's, I, I, I can speak from a bit of experience. I played at, at, for Saints against Hull KR in 2013, and I got my cruciate snap by a cannonball tapple, tackle. I carried, someone held me up high, and then someone came from the side and took my knee from, from, from underneath me. Now, at the time, it wasn't a legal tackle, so nobody got banned. Mm. But obviously, I was out for nine months, and it could have ended my career, but fortunately, it didn't. But that player didn't really do anything wrong, but it's up to... Up to the, the game, the, isn't it? the game, the governing body to kind of identify what mm. can be perceived as dangerous and then act accordingly. Um, but like, like I said, firstly, has it made you think about the way you tackle? If because because I, I, I can imagine after the you must have got quite a bit of abuse. And, which and, and should was, it be was, an illegal tackle? I know that's a weird question to ask you, but do you think if the RFL look at the rules in the off season, given what's happened, but if you should, that, should it be changed? But if they do do that and change the tackle, then he has no choice other than to change his tackle technique. Yeah. No, no, but I mean, you know, for example, if that happened on you. If that tackle happened yeah. on me. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, if, if it happened on me, it's sort of hard to say because it hasn't. Uh, I don't know how they feel about it. Um, but all I know is it's it's the way I've tackled my whole career. It's sort of hard to change for me, um, especially against big boys. Um, and um, I normally, if they run at me, I go in as hard as I can. Um, and yeah, I just sort of do my best, but I do, I do get a lot of, um, backlash off my wife, obviously, because she doesn't like me doing those tackles mm -hmm. because she's scared for my safety all the time. Um, but it's, it's like, um, for me, it's like almost an instinct because mm -hmm. I've been doing it for so long. Mm -hmm. Um, it just happens. Um, and like, yeah. Um, it's would you rather get abuse off the fans or your wife? <laughs> Um, probably the fans. <laughs> yeah, <I'm thinking laughs> Saints fans. Enough of them are comfy, haven't they? Oh, there's a lot of them, but it's okay. Your teammate Tom Amorne came to your defence, didn't he? Yeah. Um, you know, obviously that must have that must have been quite pleasing for you to see one of your one of yeah. your own just straight backing you up on that. Yeah, Tom's been pretty much my right hand man in my squad. Um, he's he just makes sure that I'm okay all the time on the field. We talk like heaps, not just you know. Um, on the field we talk heaps but off the field he, he asks me so many questions about rugby league and footy and what can he do better and um, like he's always got my back I know that um, no matter what situation especially on the footy field I, was think, it, was he, I think he said sorry did, he, did, did, did you get death threats off the back of that was it, was oh. that, was it did, did, did no it wasn't really it wasn't death threats I never said it was death threats I think there was a lot of abuse um, towards the way I was tackling and, and they said that oh just different comments that I don't want to repeat um, because a lot of those I sort of just brushed away. Um, because How did it make you feel though when you're reading it? Oh, I just, for me personally, because I don't, I'm not normally in the, in the spotlight for yeah. doing something bad. Um, it was sort of hard for me to handle, but my wife sort of got rid of a lot of those messages before I could even see them. Um, and then she just said, you know, you don't need to focus on what other people say. You just, you know, you look at us, you look at your teammates, you look at your coaching staff, they've got your back. They know who you are personally. You're not going out there to hurt anyone. Um, it's part of the game and, it's you know, sometimes it's very unfortunate. Um, but when people start to come at you, just don't worry about what their opinions are. I think it's a, it's a, was to... your faith important to you? Was I? You, your faith important to you at that time? Did it, yeah, did my it, faith, did it help you a lot? My faith plays a part in everything. Yeah. everything um whether it's good whether it's bad um whether i'm in trouble whether uh, i'm doing it tough um you know if i have like a couple of years oh when i was in cowboys i lost my uncle and my grandma within a couple of months um and it, it's always got to do with faith you know mm -hmm. my faith is what keeps me going every single day um because you know we always look at things things happen for a reason uh things happen for us to grow as people and as individuals um and for this instant it was about just you know sticking to those who who know who you are and and not matter about what the backlash noise is because there's always going to be that I, th I think it's a really fascinating conversation though because again you've done nothing wrong in the eyes of the law mm -hmm. and the fact that it went to a panel of rfl experts yep. inverted commas you've got paul wellens coming out and saying that you know the rfl are failing to protect players yep. but obviously i assume you will continue to do this this tackle until it's outlawed right so let's just say lee get to a grand final you do it again right yeah and that's the point yep 
So, well, the so Carl, you're but, on the RFL panel, right? The RFL. In the off season, what do you do? You know, in terms of looking at changing the laws. Oh, look, well, that's very difficult, isn't it? Because that's down to you know, you know, they've, they've, there's got to there's got to be a big discussion about it, hasn't it? Whether they see it's fit. But well, obviously, look on this instance where uh, John's case got brought forward, mm -hmm. the game, the disciplinary panel, what did what was their outcome? Well, the outcome of the verdict was not that guilty. He's not guilty. Yeah. So, until but will that, that not encourage other players to tackle that because it's so I'd, effective? I'd, it's a weapon, right? Well, it works. Look, what, what what John was able to do was he was able to take two effective ball carriers out of the game. Now it's just very unfortunate that they it's suffered. Not, job to, not to take them out of the game. No. It's to, to fell just, them. Just, to just, take no, them no, down. No, no, yeah, stop. Stop. I didn't mean to take yeah. them out of the game. Yeah. And 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 it, well, basically, the emotion around losing two of your quality front rowers mm. one's an England international Parsi had been pretty you know Tongan he'd been in exceptional form you're headed into the business end of the year you're out of a challenge cup I can understand totally I can understand totally why the emotion and everything was all there but having said that again until the law gets changed it can't be you know the chicken wing that would have been once upon a time People would have been chicken winged all the time, the hip drop, and the how many shoulders would have gone, and, and all mm -hmm. that with that. But then, what would have happened was the game would have gone right. Enough's enough. We're seeing too much. These players are now at risk, and then they've changed the they've changed the law. I probably think I probably think that if the game was going to go down that road and maybe change the law, I do think so because two knees, you know, a knee can change your career forever. Uh, you know, it certainly can even change your life forever, really. But I think that I think it's something that they do need to look at. I think I, I don't like I said I don't like the tackle. I think it's dangerous for you. I think it's dangerous for them. But without going round the houses over and over again, until that law gets changed, John Asiata hasn't done anything Correct. wrong. And I was actually again. very very fast before I had my knee injury. It changed it changed me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that way you had to move it to a different position. Yeah, could have been halfback Slowed me throughout down. your career. <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting just looking at your body language. I don't know whether you just got bored of us because we've been talking for an hour and forty. Yeah, probably. But no, but you've 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 closed up a little bit on that because it's like we're, I'm not here to accuse you. It's I think there are, Yeah, it is. But I think there were a whole load of people. It was not 50 50, but there was still a lot of support for you. Yeah. You know, it wasn't just everyone was coming for you. Obviously, there was a lot of Saints people on social media and whatever. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it has affected you, right? That, yeah, that. it has because it made me think about, you know, obviously what I can do to other people and how I've just injured two, two guys. Um, but then also what I can do to me if I'm, if for one split second I'm just, I get caught with a knee. Mm -hmm. Like that could just end me. And especially me being with, my neck injury and all, it, I really, I, I put myself in that position all the time and I know, you know, the consequences to it if I get caught with a knee. Um, but the thing that I, I think for me that I'll always stay true to is I will just play the game the way I've played the game my whole life. I wouldn't change unless something has, makes me change. Um, so if they change the rules, then I have to, I have to change the way yeah. I tackle. Um, but, yeah, I bet your missus wants the, them to change the rules. So <laughs> She'll you be on the panel. Yeah. <laughs> Look yeah. after John, Mark, Kyle, can Lee in the grand final? Well, of course they can. They've, they've showed in in the Challenge Cup semi against Saints and in the in the in the Challenge Cup final that they can they can turn on a big performance when it matters. Um, will they? I don't know. I think Wigan, Catalan Saints will be hard to beat. Looking at the form, but you know they've got the strike, they've got the experience, and um, yeah, I think momentum's big at this end of the season. I think they lost a tight game to, to Saints and then, um, yeah, um, but I think another good win going into playoffs and you, you never know. There should already be a documentary about Lee, shouldn't there? There yeah, really should be in yeah. terms of, because the characters they've got there, the owner, you know, the players. Well, if they've, done, if they've done an all or nothing this year, that's what I mean. the right one, haven't they? But to answer your question, look, obviously now doing what I do, you, 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 you have to have an opinion, otherwise it's pointless yeah. doing it. I think Lee have been very, very, very successful. I think obviously winning the Challenge Cup is huge. Mm. I don't think they win the grand final. I don't. I think they've you think got, Saints go five? I don't know if Saints go five either. Obviously, but look, Friday night's going to tell us who's, who's going to get those two home semi-finals. That's big. Yeah. And if it, if it goes as you would imagine, you would imagine that Wigan had finished top, Catalan's second, Saints third. So then you were almost thinking, I mean, look at that Saints-Warrington game the other day, as mm. dominant Saints were. Warrington had four chances where if they'd have put them away, they could have beat them. Do you know what I mean? So, But whoever has then got to go to Catalan. Now, Catalan in Catalan is a different gravy. We saw last year Hull KR when they went there and and, 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 and how big of occasion that Although, was. Although, Wigan turned them over the other week. They did, they did, but I don't think Catalan play that bad ever again. 
Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think they just had, I think they suffered their losses probably at the right time for Steve McNamara. I mean, I was talking to Sam Tompkins last Sunday and he said that, that you know, that that little blip needed to come now instead of two weeks down the line. Do you know what I mean? So, I uh, look. I, I think the finals between one of them, th- uh, two of them, three, yeah. two of them I top Catalan, three. I think so. Catalan, but hold on. There's someone sitting here. He, he, he's probably going to tell sorry, me that. Sorry, in that like he was not this end there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. The old guy is not going to be angry at me. He's, he's no. John Asiata, the, the feeling must be that that you guys can do anything. That it's mission impossible. Yeah, it's not mission impossible. I think it's it's been the story of our season. And like I said in before, no one's given us a chance. We've done the Challenge Cup. No one's given us a chance to stay up. Yeah. We're finishing the top six. We'll probably finish fourth or fifth, depending on how this weekend goes. Mm. Um, but I mean, even to get where you've got to, though, even even yeah, to get where you've got the, to, and the, the, this. But if you if you were to get to a grand final to win the Challenge Cup, yep. no one in the no. world of rugby league no. would have said that that was possible. Yeah, hundred percent. And it's just it's just going to go down to, do we believe enough that we can do that? To me, I, I believe that we can go all the way. Um, but to get a whole group to believe that, it's a different story. And I think we're not far off. Um, this is where we need your dad, right? And my dad's, dad's always with me, man. That's <laughs> what I mean. He's Just to say that, me. like you said in 2015, don't worry. Don't worry. It's all right. My, dad, the grand my dad turns up on Monday anyways. Oh, does it? Oh, <laughs> yeah, nice. Does. So does he? It'll be good to have him here. Will you, Amazing. Will you have family over for the Challenge Cup? Uh, my sister and my brother-in-law. So my sister and partner surprised me, yeah. I will go on record, by the way, and if Lee do get there and win, well, brilliant for the game. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm. But, you know, you put me on the spot and you ask me, I don't think you win. No, no, that's what you're here for. Opinions, a game of opinions, isn't it? I mean, from the outside... still your friend. (laughs) Still everybody's friend. (laughs) From the outside, uh, what a story it would be. John, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate, having you down. Thank you so much. Like, what a story, Carl. We were speaking before, weren't we, outside? This is why, certainly I love doing this podcast and why we've done it for so long is because you ask a question to someone and it opens up a whole story and you, and you ask a question that you don't know the answer to and for an hour you can sit there and I can just listen to John's tale. Yeah, well the beauty of it is Will, obviously look, you've got a couple of little notes in front of you but, but it's actually John that takes us on his journey, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And, and he leads the way and it's it's brilliant, you know, and thanks a lot yeah. for sharing everything you have done tonight. No, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Very today, nice to so meet you, I appreciate it. Top man. And look, God, God, I'll say it, I'm not even a Lee fan but I want Lee to win the grand final. Yeah, there we go. And I want a night out with Derek Bowman and Derek. I want you on the podcast. But it's going to have to be next season. I want a night out with Derek. It looks mad. Months ago, we were trying to set Derek Bowman up with a charity boxing match with John Wilkin, which I'd still like to see. But I think now Mm. they've become friends, they wouldn't do that. We wouldn't be as vicious as we'd expect. John shit himself and thought, well, I'm going to be friends (laughs) with I want to be friends because I want to get near Conor McGregor's yacht. You're pathetic. That's why you're not here anymore. Uh, Thanks for watching, listening, everybody. At Out of Your RL. Thank you. John Asiata. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.